uh, tonight. Uh, G3 ZPS is, um, like many of us in this room, uh, an amateur who started uh, life in amateur radio in the 1960s uh, and uh, is going to talk about old ham radio gear, why the hell did we bother? What I need to tell Steve is that uh, we've done our talks probably the wrong way round. We started off uh, at the beginning of January with Rob Sherwood uh, giving us a great talk about the work he's done on a, a radio performance and how he measures it and what are good modern radios. And then we moved on to uh, Frank Howell, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, who by trade is a statistician who gave a fantastic talk uh, looking at the stats, modelling the price of radios when they came out, uh, their performance as measured by Rob Sherwood, and then uh, comparing it to the reviews people gave on eham.net. Again, that was about modern radios. So no one yet, Steve, has talked about the radios you've got in your picture there. So I'm going to I'm going to hand the microphone over to you and uh, give you a, a very good welcome to tonight. And we're looking forward to the talk. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Nick, and very uh, good evening to uh, Denverdale Radio Club. Um, yeah, another talk from me. I've been very busy at the end of last year and into this year. Just a quick word about me before we get started. Can you all see my screen share OK? Good. Um, yes. um, just a quick word about me. Yeah, uh, Nick's quite right. I got my license in 1970, so I'm at the end of the G3 course. I've been caught out a few times by people. I was caught out a few days ago by G3J, and I blathered on for about five minutes about old radio kit, and then he told me it was reissued only a few years ago to him, which I didn't really agree with because he didn't seem to know the guy who had the call originally. Anyway, I'm an original G3. They ran out just after I got my ticket. I was at school, so I am actually one of a, a handful of G3s who are quite young, uh, 66, 67, there aren't many because we've all had um, our course for 50 years, 51 years for me now. Um, my background is I trained as, a, as an engineer, uh, electronics engineer with government. Um, I qualified and became an RF design engineer for the Ministry of Defence in the, in the uh, 70s. I left the MOD and joined the Met Police in the early 80s, and that's the subject of another talk where I became a senior systems engineer looking at uh, clever stuff for police comms, and that's my, that's my other talk, um, which we'll probably get around to at some point. Um, I'm a fellow of the IET. Um, I started for some reason, going back to my childhood and about 20 years ago with old radio kit, and, and that's really what the subject of this talk is. Uh, but before we get going, uh, just a bit of a health warning, really, for some of you that perhaps uh, haven't really collected any old radio junk or um, are worried, you know, what, what it's all about. And you've got something that looks like this in your house. Um, if this is your idea of, um, of a shack, uh, 7300 or whatever, and a desk with a microphone and a computer, then you best go away and pour yourself a cup of coffee now and come back in about an hour. Uh, because, you know, you could end up with a garage that looks like this. Uh, mine isn't quite that bad, uh, but it, 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 it does tend to get a bit obsessive. Um, or your partner might be talking on the phone like this. Greg's gone to the auction to get rid of some stuff. Uh, but Greg's come back from the, uh, the ham radio rally with a load more stuff. Sadly, some of that rings true with me and a lot of my friends. Um, if you're really bad, you might end up like this guy. This is W9EVT. One or two of you might have seen him. Um, that's only one of his rooms. He's got rooms dedicated to all the main mates of ham radio gear. That's just one of them. And his outbuilding is bigger than my house. It's bigger than my garden. So if you really want to see some, some junk, go to a W9 um, EVT on, on QRZ. So uh, you have to decide if you want to look away now. OK, let's go back to the back to the future. Well, back to the beginning, really, in the 20s and the 30s, because valves are quite central to uh, some, <clears throat> some of the old gear that I'm going to talk about. Um, valves were around, of course, 1915, uh, First World War, there was uh, uh, radios in aircraft and radios on the ground and transmitters and valves were sort of um, uh, started to come good. Uh, by, by the Second World War, um, just about all the research to do with valve technology had been done. 
things got smaller after the war, uh, but just about it, every aspect of thermionic technology had been resolved in the period between the wars. And there's the EF50 on the right, which is supposedly the valve that helped, uh, help, uh, certainly when the Battle of Britain uh, here, um, because it was used in, in all the radar, uh, radar gear chain home and the like. Um, there it is, the old, the venerable EF50. You can use it for everything. Um, so valve technology moved very, very quickly from uh, the First World War through to uh, uh, 1939. Um, broadcasting took off, of course, to a low calling uh, here in the UK uh, from uh, 1924 and 1925. Uh, Ham started to uh, initially uh, have HF and VHF spectrum almost unlimited to themselves, but pretty quickly as um, um, administrations around the world spotted uh, the, the use of HF and VHF for broadcasting. Hands were compartmentalized into the bands, many of which we know and love today. Uh, Spark disappeared about 1922. This is from an American magazine with a valve sitting pretty there with its boxing gloves on, and it's just beaten the hell out of Spark. Um, transatlantic tests with, with uh, valve radio equipment pretty much spelled the end of Spark transmitters. 1922, that's when Ham started to use the short waves, not that short actually, but you know what I mean, 200 meters or so. And Spark very rapidly disappeared as the, uh, the valve took off. Off the shelf ham radio kit was, um, was not really around much, um, certainly not in the UK, um, uh, through, the, um, uh, through the 20s and the 30s. Uh, pretty much you had to be an experimenter. You could buy the parts, of course, uh, but you pretty much had to be an experimenter. Um, and, you know, you probably had to dress like uh, Gerald Mark Hughes here, G2NM, um, if, you, uh, if you were going to operate. I particularly love the, uh, you know, you'd, but, but somebody said to me the other day, why don't we dress up these days, you know, wear a tie when we're operating, it's only looking. I thought about wearing a bow tie tonight, actually. So that's Gerald. Um, but the, certainly here in the UK, it wasn't into the 30, really into the 30s that any sort of off-the-shelf ham radio gear um, started to become available. Um, this is from just up the road from me in Bromley, in fact, pretty much where I was uh, operating, where I was born and where I operated in my early childhood years. Um, if you look at all those radios down on the left, those receivers, I think we've got um, GMW7JMM on the call, but um, there's some... Um, uh, a uh, Sky Buddy, uh, Hallicraft of Sky Buddy, and here's an RME 69. And of course, they're um, they're both. Uh, in fact, everything in that advert um, is um, is um, is US. Um, uh, the, the reason it, it's a little bit unclear why the, the Brits didn't really get their act together, and there were questions in some of the magazines, shortwave magazine. You know, where where is the where where is British communication receivers? I guess part of the reason were valves are expensive. They had dropped in price from the 20s and the 30s. My God, they were expensive in the 20s. And of course, those sort of prices, if you if you go up there, 38 pounds for an RME 69. If you look back to the average wage in the 30s and 1936, 37, that's between, you know, a radio that costs between 30 and 45 pounds a receiver. That's that's up to two months wages. So um there had to be a market for it, and maybe the Brits were a bit slow off the mark, um, thinking that there wasn't a market. Of course, uh, a name that some of us uh, uh, grew to know and love, Eddie Stone, uh, appeared um, in the late late thirties. But you look down at the price, uh, you look at the price down there, uh, 45, 45 pounds. So that that's pretty much, unless you're in a high earning job, that's two months' wages. But of course, things started to change for radio hands um, um, uh, during the war and just after. So we just have a look at, you know, why, why, uh, what happened uh, uh, during the war. And of course, many of us who have been around in this hobby for a long time would have used kit that um, has its lineage back in uh, in World War Two and back um, through the military. So um, the world changed, and a radio became absolutely crucial. It was sort of used in the First World War, but now in the Second World War, radio kit, this was the communications war. This was the first real technology war. And here we have the three armed forces, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. 
And of course, they all had different needs for communication, their own specific needs, which swung the whole machinery across the world, really. Um, specifically, I, I'm, I'm mainly talking about the UK here, the whole R&D of manufacturers uh, for, for military support swung into action. And the pace of, of development and manufacturing capability uh, across the world was quite, quite staggering. Of course, the, 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 it resulted in an absolutely massive production and, and uh, diversity of, um, of, uh, of, of radio equipment. But of course, what happened, as many of us know, um, is that uh, immediately at the end of the war, this absolutely huge amount of kits started to appear on the um, on the um, on the surplus market, and I've called it the, the surplus explosion because it actually went on for a very a very long time. It's just staggering. I, don't, I keep saying it, but the amount of stuff, uh, gear, and parts and accessories that were made um, just it. it I find it quite amazing uh, even now. Um, of course, it brought a term which, which appeared in the 50s, and um, some of you might, might have heard of it, the term boat anchor. <laughs> um, and at, at Newell, it appeared in the USA. Yeah, there's, we'll come on to that receiver in a minute, it weighs 100 pounds. Many of you will know what it is. Um, and I, I researched where this phrase boat anchor came from. And the earliest I can find, and if you know anywhere else where it might have came from, is a letter to CQ magazine, the American Amateur Radio magazine in 1956, where um, a reader, and you can look it up, I think it's on one of the websites, a reader asked about converting wartime gear to amateur use. And he got what I think is a rather, 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 not unreasonable, but it's a rather cutting reply, isn't it? bearing in mind the amount of surplus kit <laughs> and it must have been pretty cheap and after all that's why a lot of you used it and the only conversion they could see is to blah 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 and use it as a rather fine anchor for a small boat and then ask readers if they've got any other conversion I thought that was um, that was pretty cutting really but if any of you know where uh, boat the term boat anchor for some of this old gear came from earlier than them I don't think you will I think that's some um, that's some um, that's pretty much uh, the earliest. So um, what sort of gear started to pop out uh, that was going to end up, you know, with some of us hands and end up, first of all, using and then having to rebuild it? Well, if you look at the army, you can have a whole presentation for VMARS on just army kit through the ages, right from them. Um, the Second World War, white right through to the stuff that's newly on the surface today. I have a whole presentation, and I'm just going to cover some of the most uh, famous bits of kit that started to um, started to pop up. Obviously, the 19 set um, was absolutely central to a load of 60s school school. I said schoolboy, school person, perhaps I could say, but it was mainly boys who um, picked up uh, 19 sets. Uh, uh, and at the time, some of them were in quite new and quite good condition. So there wasn't so much re restoration or refurbishment work. It was conversion to get them on them on the top band and 80 meters. And some have even been converted to side band. These days, they're, um, they've become extremely expensive and desirable as a, um, the, the vintage uh, vehicle uh, uh, people who do reenactments will buy a 19 set, even if it's not working, just to put in their Jeep. And most of the, the parts are relatively available. <coughs> and um, considering the price they were, um, this is a 62 set, which is um, a bit like a 19 set, but low power, only one watt. And this is the 18 set. I'd love to get hold of one of these. Uh, separate transmitter and receiver, only 250 milliwatts. But this is pretty specialist stuff to refurbish and repair these days. And most of the time, you'll only, only hear it on the VMARS, uh, Vintage and Military Amateur Radio Society, which I've got at the top left there. Most of the time, you'll only hear this on their uh, on their AM nets or maybe on their CW nets, not so much in general operation on the HF bands. Um, but green radio generally has become a really big thing for some. I mean, it's not all green, but it's a sort of generic term right the way through to things called Larkspur and Klansman, which I, I knew when I worked in the MOD. It's very popular 
Klansmen, uh, and and there's a whole range of green radio kit around the world. Some of it Ray Cool, some of it extremely expensive, um, and quite hard to refurbish because it was it was really made for extremely tough environments. Uh, it's not the easiest stuff to repair, as some of the stuff we we'll talk about later. Um, so um, here's the uh, here's the 19 set advert from um, from the um, uh, 60s from the, some of the ham radio magazines in the 60s here in the UK. John's Radio in Bradford, not that far from you. And I think it says there every set supplied new in carton with a 12 connector and full book, including circuits at four pounds ten shillings, four pounds fifty. Um, I'm not sure what the dollar exchange rate was in 1968-69. Probably um, quite good, probably two or three, but um, there, there it is. And uh, you can have an ATU for a pound. Um, and um, what else? It's a case to plug into power sockets to run the receiver. That's uh, 70 shillings. <coughs> so, um, and the charge of 10 bob, 50p to unpack and test it. So, uh, you know, imagine what they're worth now. OK, you have to uh, bring the money forward in the uh, inflation calculators. Uh, but it was sort of if you know five quid from a few paper rounds, you could afford a 19 set. So there's some of the green radio kit, which I'm not going to go. It, it, it you know, could go on and on about green radio. And it's actually quite difficult to recognize one from another. Um, I find it's ruggedized stuff, but one or two people I know are dead into this kit and uh, they will buy it. But as I said, it, it's quite hard to repair and refurbish unless you really, uh, really know what you're doing. But if you've been in the signals and you've got an affinity for it and you've used it, then um, you love it. And um, there's loads of it out there. So um, the other service um, kit early before the uh, before the Second World War, um, just before um, there was a classic receiver which found its way into loads of, of hand checks. Um, and so this is called the Marconi CR100 B28. There it is. Um, quite highly regarded. Um, uh, people have refurbished quite a few of these. Fairly easy to refurbish. There is one downside, which I'll cover at the end of this section to all of these radios, but it's pretty basic 50s valve technology. And if you've got any understanding of that technology that is not tremendously um, difficult to restore these radios and uh, there's a few specialist restorers but for me again they came out in the 60s and they were available on the surplus market in pretty good condition just turn them on and use them um, the other big one that um, again um, uh, came onto the surplus market in the 60s is the Admiralty B40 an absolute beast of a radio, a ship's radio made by the Murphy Company and under license by others, where weight is not really an issue um, when it's on a ship. And if you're ever down here in London and you can go onto the Belfast, they've got a few on there. Um, and some ships apparently had quite a few of these on different HF frequencies. Again, buying them in the 60s, relatively cheap, not, not that cheap actually. Um, and you could turn them on and use them these days because of their age, they will need work. Um, and the downside um, for all of these, these big boat anchor radios for me is the weight of uh, just getting inside them. And the military stuff tends to be a little bit harder. Um, it was built specifically to be serviced by um, personnel who are very experienced. So um, um, you don't just buy one of these um, and with little knowledge and take it apart and try and refurbish it. But they, they were they were big back in the day, £22, 10 shillings back in the late 60s. So compared to the 19s, um, a bit out of um, bit out of reach of, of a lot of kids. But I do know some young young hams in my generation who managed to get their mums and dads to buy them uh, B forties carriage, 30 bob. That makes me laugh. Uh, such a just a heavyweight a bit of kit. Um, uh, the Air Force, uh, some classic radios here again, which have uh, found their way to ham shacks back then and now are being restored by uh, lots of mainly VMARS members. The R1155, 80,000 of those made. Uh, but they came on the surplus market pretty quickly in 1947. Um, the R1155 was uh, used in World War II bombers, most famously, probably the Lancaster bomber. 
Uh, here it is down at the bottom with its companion receiver, the T1154, which is the thing with the coloured knobs above it. Um, even just those coloured knobs go for a fortune. Now, people are buying anything on eBay at the moment. Maybe the lockdown has driven them mad, but um, uh, they're quite desirable now and have got quite rare. Um, uh, from, I think we've got for, for Jim, who's on the call, um, these World War II command sets designed by Collins, but made, we'll come on to Collins in a minute, but made by others, other companies. Um, uh, again, in the 60s, it um, came on the surplus market cheap, and now they're quite expensive to pick up. And there's a whole range of these uh, airborne uh, sets that um, even, I think, VMOS have their own net for one or two uh, one or two uh, airborne sets. This is um, an American picture I found um, of a um, surely aircraft that might have been a B uh, B twenty five. I can't remember, but you look at the amount of kit a flight engineer has got. He's got um, just got such a staggering all the command receivers, um, sort of um, uh, near communications, uh, uh, local communication receivers at the top top there. Um, and uh, the ALT-13, which is another bit of kit at the bottom, but uh, the BC-348 um, um, Hallicraft is received there in the middle, which is just leaning over. But you know, man, the kit, um, it's got to use. You can see, well, I had to have a flight engineer. It's just a staggered, staggering amount of, um, of, um, of hardware this, these, um, these guys had to, um, had to uh, be familiar with and use. So again, I'll, I'll, so moving on to after the war, all this surplus has come on the market, but there are other stuff that started to appear, <coughs> um, which um, we uh, which we could term old hand radio kit, but it's a lot of it where it ended up. Possibly the most famous for, for me, one of the most famous receivers ever made is the RCA AR88. Came out of an earlier version, but it's became it's become iconic uh, with radio hands. I've had two of them. Um, uh, 1941 to 1951, um, 25,000 or more, loads of them used over here in the Y stations. I've had two of them. Um, repairing and refurbishing them is quite challenging. The, the, the big thing for me is the weight that does knock on 100 pounds. Uh, just getting it out of the case is a two person job, slides forward. Um, um, and there are. Um, uh, there they are on the Y station, um, one of the pictures of uh, Y intercept stations listening to uh, Enigma code traffic, uh, probably. Some of the Y stations had racks of AR-88s. Um, the refurbishment, there are, there are some capacitors, they're called bathtub capacitors in them, which have got some PCB chemicals in them, which are a health hazard, and drilling into them to replace uh, the capacitors inside with more modern components is perhaps not the safest thing to do. Um, also, the wiring has faded in, in mine, at least, to all very similar dark grey or black. So finding you know, what, what uh, part of the loom goes where can be quite challenging. But for me, the big thing is the weight. Um, uh, it just, you know, the 100 weight, uh, heavyweight bits of kit. But again, there are people around now who will completely strip down, <coughs> strip down an AR-88, <coughs> excuse me, and refurbish it front to back, absolutely classic uh, receiver. Um, uh, this is another one that's um, become very popular, uh, the uh, AR-88 National, sorry, the National HRO. Again, many of those brought into the US, uh, to the UK from the US, it goes back to probably not that many communication receivers made here and we were caught out as the war appeared and had to buy uh, had to buy stuff in for our listening stations. So um, we were caught out, I guess, a bit. Plug in calls at the bottom, uh, read off the frequency by looking at the graph and the dial together. Um, the thing about a lot of these uh, receivers is that for radio hands, as they became available to us, is that they're, they're pretty good at what they do. So for CW, uh, my AR88 with its crystal filter, it, it did everything I want. I could work uh, DX on top band right down into the noise. I felt I could hear the electrons bouncing off the aerial, the staggering receivers. So <clears throat> it made great sense for me to have an AR88 in the early 70s. Um, 
because there wasn't really anything else on the market which was um, you know built with that level of quality and performance and stability um, in, in mind and um, you know, uh, an AR88 was an expensive thing to buy on the surplus market um, but a uh, new kit was, was more expensive, very nice to use on sideband, we will come on to later, but not necessarily brilliant for a CW and very good on AM, of course, as well. So there you go, plug-in coils, they've got quite collectible, annoyingly, so buying an HRO, you really need to have the coil packs for the bands you want, and of course, people know the value of some of these things. Um, another classic receiver, which has started to appear in loads of ham shacks, these days is the uh, is the RA17. Fabulous. Apparently, Raykel were a very small company in the early 50s and they wanted a license, an American make. Um, but um, they were a small company and they couldn't do the deal. Um, and they managed to have uh, eke out a government contract here. And so they went for this thing called the Barlow Wadley Loop, which I won't go into detail, but um, and quite a unique uh, system to eliminate drift from a super head style radio. And um, they, uh, their design team got to work and brought out this thing called the, this thing, Raykel RA17. Um, so from 1995, <coughs> apparently <coughs> you could buy um, getting them for a small house for the price the government paid for one of these, an incredibly expensive radio uh, with um, the slide rule, uh, not slide rule, the uh, film strip, uh, film strip dial here, six feet per megahertz. Um, all in screen boxes, a top class professional bit of kit. Again, a hard to refurbish if you come by one and you decide that you're going to rebuild one um, because of the, of the of the way it was built and it was built for a professional. Uh, companies to refurbish and module change back in the day but um, I've, I've used one and I've seen a few in quite a lot of ham shacks around and they are absolutely staggering uh, radios and um, very stable popular with loads of, of government departments and um, here's a classic picture of, um, of a load of RA17s now when I give this talk to people in public uh, which sadly I can't do now I've been able to do for a while um, I say you know where do you think that is um, if it's in the UK, as um, some people get the right answer, it's actually here. It's from Doctor No. If you've seen Doctor No, the first James Bond film, um, there's um, apparently these RA17s. It was just the front panels and the knobs and a few bits. All the rest of the radio, of course, to film prop. Why bother with it? Whether they cut them up, <laughs> bought them on the surplus market, I don't know. But um, there's the um, there's uh, one of the famous pictures from um, uh, from uh, from James Bond. So just taking a deep breath, um, we've gone through all this uh, surplus kit, which from the war, uh, Second World War up to the uh, 70s, started to pop out on the market. All of it eminently usable and, and could be refurbished. Some easier than others. The later kit more difficult, uh, but uh, usable. Takes up a lot of room. Um, uh, but um, it can be used in the ham radio and some of it absolutely brilliant performers. So moving to sort of more ham, ham radio specialist kit, we, uh, we're just going to go through some of the popular makes. I can't go through them all, there's just far, far too many. Um, pretty much the, 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 the one that I, I picked first is Collins. Um, Collins started his company, here he is, Art Collins W0CXX. He started his company before World War II, making ham radio kit mainly for the American market. So he was pretty quick off the mark as well as other American companies, probably because there was a big ham population in the US, uh, big home market. And he spotted um, after doing some um, other work that he could just build up a business um, selling ham radio kit. Um, as he moved into the Second World War, the work he had to do absolutely took off and he became a huge military supplier. Um, after uh, the Second World War, all of that military supply fell away and this uh, Collins and one of, at least my other company, fell on hard times because the military contracts dried up. It's a huge amount of kit produced and new kit uh, wasn't required. OK, the Cold War was going on, but the, the, the volume of work that uh, Collins had uh, dropped away a little bit. Um, so um, just after the war, he was he was big into uh, 
uh, AM uh, ham radio um, uh, in the US market. Uh, and he built his reputation as he did through the uh, uh, through the uh, Second World War on, on super duper quality. And he carried that through. <clears throat> he abandoned a thing called the VFO, the variable frequency oscillator with his team and, and it became the PTO, the permeability tuned oscillator, which is a coil with a, um, uh, with a, with a core, dust iron core or ferrite core going up and down in it to move the VFO frequency much more stable. Uh, and they uh, they effectively became one of the first to use that. Um, so very stable, very accurate readouts uh, for frequency, uh, and mostly very large and still very heavy. Uh, this is the uh, not many came into the UK. Um, this is the KW1 one kilowatt um, AM transmitter in its rack. However, by the, uh, the end of the 1940s and into the 50s, um, a whole HF communications market was starting to uh, change. And by 1955, Art Collins embraced pretty much that single sideband was going to be the future of HF communications. Um, and he saw uh, that the companies, um, his company would be right at the forefront. He quickly managed to demonstrate um, uh, to the US uh, Strategic Air Command that it was far superior to AM through uh, Curtis LeMay, who was a radio ham, who was sold on SSB and Collins realised that now he had a market, SSB, uh, that he could sell to the um, military and it was going to be the future of ham radio as well. So he, he started to, um, to withdraw from AM and move to single sideband. Um, and became a bit of a game changer. So um, this guy, uh, Gene W0ROW, had a bit of an idea uh, in 1956-57. Uh, um, he was looking at these uh, Collins 75A4 receiver there on the left and the KWS1 transmitted there on the right. Now they, they are known colloquially around the world uh, and certainly here in the UK as the gold dust twins, the pinnacle of sort of uh, that um, bow tanker style of Collins uh, equipment uh, for um, uh, AM and, and SSB, early SSB. Uh, the KWS one, which is there on the right hand side, that's just the, the, uh, the RF part. Um, the, uh, the power supply is in a cabinet, which is like that KW one I showed you in the earlier picture, a big cabinet. Uh, that, that radio, the KWS one, was reviewed by Shortwave magazine in 1957 here in the UK, and it was 940 pounds in 1957. Could only be bought with dollars. So I guess you had to write a check and send it to the US and get your bank to convert it. And 940 pounds in 1957, um, you could buy a car for 500 quid, a new car. That gives you a, a, an idea of the price here in the UK and then the, the price premium of Collins, uh, Collins kit. Gene had this idea, he had these two radios in his basement, he worked for Collins, and he had this idea, he thought, well, they've both got a VFO or PTO in them. Uh, they've both got a BFO or a carrier oscillator in them, and they've both got a crystal oscillator to determine what band they're on. We call it heterodyne oscillator sometimes. And he thought, well, those three bits of the radio are in both radios, both the receiver and the transmitter. Why do I need two of them? If we're gonna have a radio that operates at one frequency, why can't I put them all into one box? Um, and he went to Art Collins with this idea and Art Collins immediately picked up on it. And of course, you know what that became. That's the birth of the, uh, the transceiver. Here it is, the KWM1 1957. Pretty much the first proper SSB transmitter. There's one in the radio center at Mil Milton Keynes in the RSDB. Um, and uh, again, the, uh, uh, the first, first to market really. Um, uh, and it quickly uh, caught on. Um, could even use use one mobile. I mean, that was unheard of uh, up until this point. I'm not sure you could put it in your Ford Anglia at the time, or your Ford Popular, but a big American car, yeah, you could fit one in. Um, and there is a rumor, if the internet is to be believed, isn't everything on Wikipedia right? That there was a KWM1 on uh, the U2 spy plane that. Um, uh, on a secret CIA frequency that Gary Powers had in it when he was shot down over Russia in uh, 1960. Is it true? I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you know better than me. So um, Collins moved pretty quickly and um, 
um, <clears throat> and came out with <clears throat> what has become a true classic radio, the, um, the KWM2 or 2A, 2A for amateur SSB transceiver. Um, and it really, uh, um, this was the follow up to the KWM2 made from 1959 to 1985, 30,000 made uh, pretty much the benchmark for SSB transceivers. Um, uh, professional quality, really work, good quality at a premium price, military and amateur, but expensive. Um, and refurbishing, refurbishing them today is not tremendously difficult, except the price. The price of buying any Collins uh, kit, which became a whole, uh, there's the inside of a KWM2, a valve transceiver became a whole line, a, a big line of equipment, which became known as the S line. And that's just part of it. Separate transmitters, receivers, linears, station monitors, the whole, the whole thing. Um, the um, the impediment to uh, restoring and rebuilding this kit today is really um, more than anything. It's the price, even the knobs or a meter or a, 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 a part of a switch. Uh, there's a big collector community in the US, and if you search on, on eBay, you'll see even just some of the small parts are tremendously expensive. Now, they're good quality and they're built to last, but if you need a part uh, that is not easy to find, it's extremely difficult to get it, uh, uh, anything. You will pay a premium for it. A lot of the kit <clears throat> that runs off 120, 150 volts because it was built for the US market. Uh, mainly. Um, it did appear all over the world, um, and there, I think there are some that operate on um, 220, 240 volts, but in the main, the stuff that comes up will need a, a, will need a, a, a transformer. Uh, and in keeping with my film score, here's Doris Day in a film called The Glass Bottom Boat. Um, I'm not sure what the telephone handsets before, but using some Collins kit. I think there's some spy story in the movie. You'll see that I like to spot my ham radio kit in, in films. So the next time they came along, um, and I've got quite a lot of this, was uh, Robert uh, Drake, uh, W8CYE. Um, he had also fallen on hard times after the, uh, after the Second World War um, and was scratching around uh, for the Drake Radio and Electronics Company, scratching around for some work. He was an amateur. He, like Collins, saw that SSB was probably the future of HF amateur radio and designed a receiver and thought, who will build it? And he offered it to some of the bigger American companies at the time, um, uh, but they didn't want to know. They were still building their big bow tanker receivers for AEM and, and CW, and they didn't want to know. So the answer was, do it yourself, uh, Robert. Get the Drake company to build your receiver and see where you go. So we built a couple of uh, an early versions. This is it, the Drake One A, one of the first purpose-built SSB SSB receivers. Uh, rather odd, <clears throat> call it the US mailbox styling upright. You know, looks like a radio that's been put on its side. Um, and he offered it to a few dealers who said, "Yeah, you build it, we'll take them." And it took off. Um, not as expensive as Collins and um, um, and a few saw its potential and he started to build up the company quickly and, and he did very, very quickly. Um, he started to um, uh, produce uh, gear. The classic gear that um, um, the Drake produced was a, a transceiver and, and the separates. This is a Drake TL4CW, um, Drake TL4 uh, transceiver. I've got four of these. I've rebuilt four. Um, <clears throat> Compact, very small uh, for their uh, for the period, quite packed in. Uh, good SSB performance. Sweep tubes, which started to appear at this time. Sweep tubes are color TV, uh, mainly in the US. Color TV line output valves designed to work only at 15 or 20 kilohertz, uh, but cost nothing. They were made in such large numbers for te color televisions in the 60s that Drake were able to buy them for uh, just cents, really. Of course, the problem is now they're very hard to get because they haven't been made for so long, you know, probably knocking on them um, um, at 50 years, 45, 50 years, 45 years at least, probably. Um, so um, uh, he also decided to use a, a PTO rather than a VFO with a capacitor. I've been using one today, uh, very stable, a few minutes warm up and it easily stays, stays very, very, very close to its um, indicated frequency. Um, 
USA stuff is expensive here in the UK, not as expensive as Collins. <clears throat> um, cheaper than Collins, though. And uh, he started bringing out separates as well. This is my B line, an R4B and a T4XB, and that's on my kitchen table. Beautiful kit. I really sort of, from uh, when I started restoring old kit in 2001, 2002, the first thing I bought was a Drake R4. And now I've got quite a lot of that kit, but it's, it's um, becoming uh, collectible here. And as I said, most of the parts are easy. Uh, they use good quality components, um, uh, but the sweep tubes are the Achilles heel. They're now getting very, very hard to, uh, to find. The transceivers have three sweep tubes in, so they'll easily put out 150, 180 or near 200 watts, <clears throat> which blows all your IC7300s out. <clears throat> Sadly, they rested on their <clears throat> reputation rather too long, as we'll see with some of the companies, didn't innovate quick enough, which was their downfall. But for a while, they had some very famous customers. Here's, uh, <clears throat> here's JY1, King Hussein, but um, you can just see he used the Drake TR7 later in his um, ham radio life, but there he has got Drake. You can just see on the left there, a part of the Drake uh, valve four line. Anyway, uh, now we move on to something that I, I've, um, I, I've known quite a lot about, which is um, KW here in the UK, KW Electronics, started by Roly Shears, G8KW, and his friend Ken Ellis, G5KW, uh, <clears throat> in um, 1956. Um, uh, Roly had a very distinguished career through the war, which I can't talk about now, not because it's a secret or anything, but there isn't time. But maybe we'll have a chat about it at the end. But he uh, he was very dis he had some very interesting stuff he did in the Second World War, and he worked in Germany after the war. Was instrumental in getting the DRS AIRC back, and they made him member number one Deutsche Amateur Radio Club. Ken Ellis was a rather colourful character, and he was awarded the Royal Robes and Dagger of Saudi Arabia in 1950 because he did some clever comms for the Saudi royal family. Which again, I won't go into in detail, but they were quite. <laughs> Uh, wartime uh, and post-war characters um, um, and um, he started KW Electronics <clears throat> near where I live here initially uh, in um, ham radio uh, kits and accessories um, and um, he started up with AM gear as a KW Vanguard um, and his KW 77 receiver um, and here's a KW Viceroy SSB transmitter. He also started to spot that SSB was, was going to be a thing here in the UK in the early 60s, where you had a lot of old radio hams who just poo pooed SSB. CW and AM, <clears throat> that Donald Duck sound's got no place on our amateur bands. But Rowley, he was a little bit of an, a thinker. He'd seen what was happening with Drake and Collins and thought, well, it's going to happen here. It's going it's to spread across. And um, <clears throat> he started to build this um, this bow tanker kit, all of which is is going up in price now. Is available, not that difficult to restore because most of the parts are readily uh, available. But again, some of that bow anchor stuff is a bit on the heavy side, and the documentation is pretty good. A bit sketchy, not as good as the military kit. Um, <clears throat> you have to have your wits about your KW circuit diagrams. The one you've got might not relate to the radio that's in front of you, but we'll come to that. So bow tanker design. But in um, 1962, uh, Rowley and the team had a bit of an epiphany. They realized that um, uh, probably uh, HF uh, SSB was going to be the um, was going to be the order and the day. And he came up, uh, the design team came up with this thing, the KW2000. This is the prototype. <clears throat> mid 1963 we know that because the photographer is just down the road from me and we raided we didn't raid the photographer we went down and we talked to the uh, proprietor i think he's now uh, not around anymore about four years ago <clears throat> and found the negatives from the photo shoot for the kw 2000 uh, which is made in dartford which is where i live uh, and that's the original prototype of the kw ssb transceiver 1963. The circuit design was very close to the Collins KWM2, very, very close to Apology. Um, some say it's a bit of a rip-off. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, <clears throat> way, way cheaper. He didn't bother with them. Um, There's no CW filter, there's no AM, and poor dial readout. 
he didn't have a VFO, a PTO, he had a VFO. And so the whole thing was cut down to a price. One valve in this one, only 90 watts. Um, very, very basic design. He basically took the Collins design and made it cheaper um, because he, they realized he could probably sell it here. Mechanical filter like Collins, we'll come back to that later in a couple of few slides time. There's a picture of it. Good performance on SSB. <clears throat> He also did another uh, clever thing. He managed to uh, fiddle all the coils so there weren't too many on the front end. I won't bore you with it too much. Basically, the radio's got a front end coil on 80 meters. Um, and then to get top band, he shunted that coil with the capacitor. And to get the other bands, <clears throat> he just shorted the secondary with a load of other uh, coils in series to get all the other HF bands. Some of you might spot that all those other coils where it says HF band, they're all in series. And they are. Um, and the big annoyance, just to give you an idea of what it's like refurbishing these, that if you <clears throat> twiddle them in the wrong order, each one affects the other one. So you have to twiddle them in the right order. It's not like you can twiddle one per band and line the radio up. And uh, not only that, he managed to uh, just wind some of the coils on a core <clears throat> and solder it directly onto the switch and then varnish it so that it can be a bit of a nightmare working on these radios. But they worked relatively simple, cheaply made, most of the parts available. Good old Roly, he did a good job. And he turned it into a winner really in the UK just for a few years, um, quickly upgraded the 2000 to an A, a B and an E model between 1964 and 1976. That's my 2000 B, which is in the room here with me now, just been refurbished. <clears throat> um, and um, it was a big hit. Uh, loads and loads of UK hams at top band. It had a, a clarifier and RIT, so you didn't have to have another VFO. So it was quite a revelation at the time. They all did. They even copied uh, an American radio, a Swan radio, and called it the Atlanta. I don't know how they got away with it and made it over here. Again, made it cheaper. Um, so good performance, nice styling. Looks a bit like um, Collins, doesn't it? The box, the cases, the, I can't see much difference. So KW decided Collins have got the S line, we're going to have the G line. And it was very popular, very, very popular. Uh, I know the company well because I, um, I used to go there as a kid with my mate who uh, was a, G4A, a G4B call, sadly no longer with us. And it was at the bottom of his roads so when I came over to Dartford to see him. We used to go to the KW showroom in Dartford and they were good to us kids, uh, 160 metres and RIT. Yeah, cheap. Um, that's where I used to go, the KW factory here in Hartford, uh, down that alleyway there with the air, as you can see them, and the showroom uh, there in the, on the, just to the right at the top. I, th I think it might be Roddy's office. So, um, <clears throat> and if any of you read shortwave magazines back in the day, KW were all over it and they started to make linears, separate transmitters, receivers, <clears throat> really um, a bit like Collins that tried to make uh, uh, a bit for <clears throat> gear for everybody. And the AM gear and the, the bow tank has disappeared very, very quickly. Um, every year uh, I run with a friend of mine, a special event station. Oh, there's that filter. Yes. They're refurbishing these KW radios with those filters. The big Achilles heel of KW radios refurbishing them these days because most of the other bits are pretty good. The resistors are awful. If you buy a KW radio and measure all the resistors, you'll find loads of them are way out of tolerance. Um, way, way, way out of tolerance. But the big Achilles heel of the, these radios is this thing called a mechanical filter. It's basically a, a bunch of discs with a, a transducer at each end and the, the, the transducers vibrate the, uh, <clears throat> the, the filter part and, and they resonate and give you a pass band at 455 kilohertz. Um, inside that can, they, the, the element is packed with foam. And over the last 55 or 60 years, that foam has degraded to the extent it clogs up the element and in worst case, stops the filter working. This is what they're like when you take them apart. Awful. It's gooey. You have to dissolve it with meths or something. It turns your fingers brown. And when you put the filter back together, you are in the lap of the gods if it will start working again. So the big Achilles heel of restoring and rebuilding KW gear is really that 
that mechanical filter. So every year we uh, we put on a, a station down here at Cray Valley Club. Um, oh yes, but I'll come back to that. Oh, the other big uh, issue with KW radios is they use British made Hunts capacitors. Even the broadcast radios and TVs that use Hunts capacitors hated them. They had a very short lifespan, absolutely terrible. And if um, if you ever buy a bit of KW kit and you open it up and see those in there, they all have to go. They all have to go. Don't bother um, testing them with the, however you want to test them, just remove them all. So every year we run a special event station down here, GV8 KW, uh, in our scout hut for Cray Valley Club with loads of KW gear. <clears throat> this year we couldn't do it, so we ran it. Um, my friend Guy ran it um, from his home. And that's Roly Shears, his son. Uh, Richard Shears operating some of our kit and he holds the call sign of his father G8KW and he's now retired but he's highly amused that after his dad died uh, in 1990 uh, sorry yeah no, in the late 1990s after his father died there's this bunch of idiots still looking after the kit that his dad lovingly ran the company that made um, KW died in about 1976 was effectively was bought out by him um, uh, Decca and uh, Decca really started to move away from ham radio kit. Um, uh, Rakel then bought Decca in the late seventies, early eighty, and uh, early eighties, and Rowley was able to buy the name back and some of the parts, <clears throat> and then started importing ten tech radios. <clears throat> but the golden era, the golden era, was up to about nineteen seventy five. Um, some more kit that some of us know and love. Eddie Stone, of course, some, some of you might know and love, might have played with <clears throat> that big slider or dial. Very large range of receivers over the years. Very well built. Um, some of the early ones are live chassis, which is um, means there isn't a main transformer. And so you have to be a little bit careful. But the downfall of Eddie Stone was really they had so many different receivers then made for government and different contractual arrangements. They never seemed to make any money. And they gradually faded and fell by the wayside. But Eddie Stone, highly regarded collectible kit in some quarters, quite easy to restore uh, because most of the bits are uh, available. Um, that's one of the classic ones, the Edison uh, EA12. Um, and that's the Eddie Stone transistor receiver that loads of people still use. Not, not brilliant performer, but quite cute. Uh, oh, and there's an Eddie Stone in, a, in Dr. No, along with KW. Uh, the early bit, we saw Dr. No earlier. This is at the beginning of the film in Jamaica where uh, where the poor lady operating the radio for the uh, um, for the British Secret Service is shot. Um, the radio's on 20 metres. That's a poor choice of frequency for, for, uh, for your uh, international espionage and spying, but if you zoom in on it, that's where it is, Dr. No. Um, I couldn't do anything, show anything about some of this whole clip without... Um, uh, looking at Kodar, Kodar 85, very simple stuff to buy and repair, little AM transmitter. The problem now that the collectors have got their teeth into these and they're tremendously expensive considering it's only a little tiny weenie AM transmitter for top band, very simple to restore and repair, no difficult to find parts whatsoever. Um, there, of course, there was a kit revolution as well. This is Heath kit, big outfit, they, you name it, they made a kit for it. Uh, for ham radio, they made a SB and HW line, which became known as Sugar Baker and Hot Water. Huge amount of ham radio kit, cheaper than buying new. Um, and for a while it was. Um, and they say it'll always work. There'll always somebody uh, at the end of a phone or who you can take it to to make it work. It was good value. Started off with AM gear. This is a HW100. This is my Sugar Baker 102. HF transceiver. Some people call it poor man Collins in the US. It's not actually much like a Collins inside, but again, quite good performance, pretty good on all bands, pretty stable. Some of them had good VFOs in them called LMOs, linear master oscillator. Um, classic one is the HW101. I've got a pair of these. Um, low cost, only uh, just over hundred pounds in the late sixties, early seventies. And of course, the thing about Heath kits, anybody of, 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 of you have ever built one, the manuals, if you restore one, the manuals are fantastic. I know some people who take apart the radio, working backwards through the manual and then rebuild it again. Uh, they're easy to restore because the, the, the manual is so good. 
Uh, most of the parts are available, but the resistors again just go off miles. Um, they're the worst part of a restoration job of Heathkit. Um, and you're finding that either the person that both the person that built it as well as the design, which means you you you, you never really know until you get started if the bloke or it was a boat maybe who built it actually knew what he was doing. Um, so you can find wire errors and dry joints because it wasn't you wasn't built in a factory. So just to pause for thought as we run a bit to the end, there's some stuff here that I haven't been had time to mention. These companies, TW Withers, Tom, Hallicrafters, Hamelin, Swan, great companies, all doomed to fall by the wayside. I haven't covered them here. They were all doomed to fall by the wayside, really, because these guys came along. Um, here he is, JA1MP, Sarko. <clears throat> he, um, he, um, we yeah, founded uh, Yesu, very influential. Yesu is a suburb of Tokyo. If any of you have got an MP radio, like the new FD 101 DX MP uh, the, and the FD 1000 MP, the MP is in honor of Sarko, who died in 1993, just as the FD 1000 was coming out. So it doesn't mean anything other than it's a homage to the founder of the company and their way of saying thank you. And they put Put his call sign letters on the end of it and now of course it lives on again with the ftdx 101 uh, mp um he, his aspirations were pretty much the same as as collins and kw started small then grew quickly started 1959 spotted that ssb uh, was going to be the uh, the thing for hf he was a radio ham he wanted good quality kit what better to do than make it in your own company um, so he started off what has become iconic, the Fox Tango, the FT line. Boy, you know, if there's ever an iconic range of ham radio kit that lives on today, then surely FT uh, is one of them. Uh, his big thing was innovation. Keep moving, keep moving, keep designing, keep changing. And he quickly expanded the company, probably because he had a lot of help from the government after the war, but they really, he really expanded the company quickly and, and innovation, whereas the other... Other companies we talked about got a little bit stuck in the mud. Um, Sarko, and of course, it wasn't long before some other companies started to uh, make their presence felt over here. Uh, Trio, which became Kenwood, and Icom, they were all waiting in the wings, all bringing them high speed innovation to um, uh, ham radio kit in a way that perhaps the Americans and the Brits were not doing. We were plodding along, good sales, valve kit, didn't need to redesign much. Not so for Sarko, he really, um, he really got going and quickly, of course, one of the most iconic radios, uh, ham radio history appeared, the FT-101. I've got three of these, I've rebuilt three of them. Um, and it's very, very high quality made uh, ham wiring, but a lot of plug-in boards. So that's why this radio is so easy to service. Um, plug-in computer style boards, everything in one box, huge global success, it's all there. No extra power supply, no noise blanker, clarifier built in. Just plug in a microphone, uh, AC, DC power supply, of course, built in, DC inverter on the back. Um, um, and that was really the radio. I believe Rowley saw one of these and realized that the M was probably nigh for a valve radio transfers and KW. They could never compete. Uh, and the US uh, also began to uh, see that the writing was on the wall. So from 1970, everything built in, good quality parts. Uh, they listened to their customers as well as Fox Tango Club in the US uh, started up and it started to write to Sarko and his team and say, oh, this receiver has transmit sprogs, receiver into mod. And they redesigned it, brought out the FT-101B, the FT-101E, there was an EX uh, and other models, but they really, they really, um, Listen to uh, listen to some of their key customer groups to improve their product. Uh, but the big thing for me was the production line. You just look at um, oh, and over a hundred thousand. Some say two hundred thousand. The FT one hundred and one uh, B and E, a massive number sold around the world. Absolutely enormous. But when you look at the production line and compare it, perhaps to pictures you could see of Drake or even KW down here in Dartford, which looks like a few people in a in a very small industrial unit. Contrast this with this uh, picture of, of uh, Yesu in the late 60s, early 70s, it disappearing into, um, 
into a perspective, you can see that they really did start to ramp up with uh, bow tanker kit, 500 watt transceivers um, uh, for the home market, uh, for the for the um, for the novice market, uh, for the US market. Uh, they started to sell under the brand name of Summer Camp. They started to look at VHF and UHF. <clears throat> we were still playing with converters and simple stuff here, but, but they just really kick-started um, this uh, Japanese invasion. Um, and really, it didn't stop much after that. And the big three, of course, as you know, came to dominate uh, HF and VHF. And other companies started to fall away. Um, uh, the FT-101ZD came out after the FT-101. This is a fairly classic um, um, hybrid boat anchor. Uh, a few other companies switched to this hybrid approach of all transistors up the front, but valves in the back, like the early FT-101. And these are now, uh, they're going up in price, but they're pretty easy to restore and repair. They don't use sweep tubes. The FT-101 B and E did use sweep tubes. These use 6146 tubes, which are relatively easy and are made in China still. Um, they're relatively easy. They're, the, 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 the transistor parts are very reliable. The mechanical parts, all mechanical parts, wear and oxidize relays, but um, they're... Um, uh, quite a few of these are appearing now. They ran into the 80s and a few of these are appearing and quite a lot are appearing on the HF bands, relatively stable, not, always, not maybe the best, but again, all in one box. If you buy one and it's in good condition, you really only need a mains lead, a microphone and an antenna uh, and you're on the air with a classic, um, and they are a bit bow tanker style. They are quite heavy, but not, not, not as heavy as, as some that came before. Um, uh, I've got a few of these that let valve FT200 transceiver. Some say this is better than the KW, but it hasn't got top band and there's no uh, clarifier independent tuning, but a simple PCB ball mounting FT200. Uh, sold hundreds and hundreds of these, right? thousands of them. Um, Henry in America and Summer Camp um, also were badged uh, here in Europe. I've got two of them. They work great, not difficult to repair. Um, there's a classic hybrid. Um, a radio from that era, the uh, Kenwood TS830, uh, sold in huge numbers, fantastic radio. Uh, again, relatively easy to repair, did use quite a lot of wire wrap, but relatively easy. And again, easy to find uh, valve parts, mechanical problems are the main things, switches and relays. Um, these are popping up and have been for a while now across the, uh, uh, across the HF bands. <clears throat> This is a TS520, that radio's little brother, and these are quite highly regarded as well and fairly simple uh, and hybrid radios. Uh, the FT901, I've got a 902. This really spelt the end of all the American and British radios. In 1998, this radio came out. <clears throat> Drake was still flogging their valve HF transceivers. This radio came out. Uh, tune up timer, noise blanker, Full, full fat AM, proper FM, uh, uh, receiver width control, built-in keyer, built-in audio filter, built-in noise blanker, um, competition grade performance, they claim receiver. I couldn't find a fault with my one, my 902. So this all signal dancing radio came out, Drake still selling old valve gear. It really showed that um, Drake and KW and, and the rest uh, had fallen two or three generations behind and were never going to catch up. And of course, they died. ICOM did play a bit with valve technology, but in the end, stuck, uh, decided to uh, be innovative and, and come out with transistor, all transistor radios uh, with some sort of synthesizer or phase or loop arrangement. And then this is the IC701. Uh, and of course, they, they just carried on to this day, innovating and innovating as they all did. And the valve, the valve radios fell away and the solid state ones um, uh, took over. Now they're all repairable and we'll just a couple of slides time before I end, cover that they're all repairable and rebuildable. But as they got more complex into the eighties, if you have a, a, a fault um, with um, one of the bigger uh, LSI chips, it's not as easy just replacing a transistor or a valve or a resistor or a capacitor, they've become harder. Uh, but ICOM really were at the forefront of all transistor radios. And of course, rigs came smaller and lighter. And we sort of got to the end of the bow tanker, although some of them are still pretty big and heavy, like the TS990 and one or two others. So maybe the bow anchor hasn't entirely gone away. 
So why do we bother bringing all this old kit back to life? Well, I think it's probably memory lane. Everybody's got a different view. Some of you can tell me at the end. Um, you know, it was young men mainly, was it? That's me listening. Well, it isn't really. Listening to a radio. You know, we didn't have much money in the 60s. You go back to a period in your life when the, you were dreaming of things. For me, I wanted to defend a Stratocaster. I've now got three or four of them because I'm a guitar player in bands. And I dreamed of owning these guitars. I, I dreamed of owning a, a sports car. And I couldn't. And I dreamed of owning, you know, learning all the Beatles songs. And I dreamed of owning a Drake TR4. But I couldn't. So as I got a bit older, you know, so the children grew up, I started to think, I started to regress back, and maybe that's what it's like for a lot of us, your army life or whatever, remembering the things from that formative period in your life where everything is brand new, and you want to go back there. You have a different view. That's pretty much um, my view. And, you know, I ate these magazines for dinner. I just couldn't get enough of them. I drooled over these adverts, and um, I couldn't afford anything. So seeing it now, it brings back those memories. And there's the Drake gear, tremendously expensive uh, for the time. And I went up to Radio Shack there in, in London and looked at them. They knew I was never going to buy anything in 18. And here in London, we had the radio shops you could go and look in the windows of. You couldn't buy anything, so you went to the surplus shops and bought cheap stuff instead. What do you need to do it? Well, not a great deal. You need some skill, you need some commitment, and you need some time. Um, you can learn, uh, anybody who hasn't got a great deal of electronic skill, of course you can learn, it's a skill to learn, take it slow, learning is fun and you never stop learning, I never stop, I don't stop now. Commitment, that's a hard one, you might get it wrong, you might make a mistake, you might short out a wire and blow up something, but you know, you can stop because that happens, don't worry about it, take a break. Um, but possibly the hardest one of all for us, we all got busy lives that we didn't have all those years ago. And radios and dusty corner and attics for years. You, you, it, you've got to get the, the you've got to get the drive to go and, and pull those things out and play with them. You don't need much to repair HF kit. That's my workshop studio. Just maybe a bit of room, an oscilloscope, digital multimeter. And that's another bit of kit to listen on. Uh, decent soldering iron and a dummy load. You don't need a great deal. <clears throat> buying and fixing it well these days it's sort of ebay isn't it everybody seems to go to ebay and unfortunately in recent years the prices certainly during the lockdown prices of everything have shot up um, i'd like to go back to these rallies and friends where i've got loads of kit from because you can do a face-to-face -face deal you can look at the mechanical condition and you you're probably not going to be able to look at the electrical condition but you can lift the hood have a look under the lid, have a chat to somebody, do a deal, knock the price down. You can't do that on eBay. Just things going for silly money now, unfortunately. It's got all the vintage kit is going up and it, perhaps it's harder now, but it's clubs and friends. They're the people uh, that do it. And the all important thing is try and get them at the right price and the right condition. With eBay, it's, it's bidding, isn't it? I hate it. Um, so do your research. You know, all the manuals for a lot of this kit are online. There's groups like VMARS. Uh, some people hate Facebook and all the forums and all that stuff and, and everything, but I, I, I don't. I, I limit it, but I do uh, look at forums. You can get daft questions like, my T4XC radio has stopped working, and then somebody will write back and say, I haven't got one, but have you tightened up the screws and changed all the capacitors? You don't have to do that, but, you know, there are there is people out there to to help and pass knowledge on uh, we just got to do a bit of research and find it if you decide on, on you want to rebuild something i don't know if any of you will um think about it carefully if you do get care and if you do start restoring kit think about what faults it's got i spend more time thinking about a fault than i do restoring it yeah, switches are going to wear out, relays are going to wear out, mechanical things are going, to, are going to need cleaning before you start. I do that. I take everything apart and clean them because trying to work only to find out you've got a dirty switch contact will drive you around the bend. So I start by cleaning them. Pots and things, you can clean them. They were remarkably long lived, uh, but I clean them before I turn an old radio on. Resistors, Old resistors are always going to fail. It makes me laugh when some people change loads of old resistors. In some old radios, they're 20% tolerance. So a 100K resistor is going to could read 120. That's the next value up. That's fine. Leave it there. Uh, plus or minus 
you could change them all if they're twenty percent. Now the radio works just the same. Some of the, the components are really not that critical unless they're specifically in a part of the circuit. Those nasty capacitors, some will need changing, some will go on forever. There's those nasty Hunts capacitors. Disc ceramic capacitors probably go on forever. And those electrolytic capacitors that we've all heard stories of, of leaking and heating up and going bang, they probably can do, and a lot of them will, and I change most of them in critical parts of the power supply. Uh, not always, but most of the time, because they're hard to test. You can test them, you can reform them, uh, but they're, and new ones are going to be smaller, so you might have to do some jiggery pokery for fitting, but they're not expensive. Again, it's, it's just taking the time and effort. Most valves are still available except sweep tubes. Um, these transistor things, they'll fail. They'll go wrong, they'll overheat and go bang. Don't think that they'll last forever. Uh, these things don't last forever either, these big chips. The problem with those is you've got to be pretty certain there's a fault with one before you take it out. And it's more specialist. So that's why I don't tend to restore 90s radios so much. I have got a few, but you know they're harder to repair. The circuits of some of the old radios are simple. The components, you can see them, they're cheap to buy. So going to the end, oops, I'm not sure what that is. Oh yeah, that's the paint. If you're really good with the paint painting, you can, uh, you're good with the paint gun, you can respray. Sorry, they're off screen. Uh, and watch out, please, if you do take a radio apart, electric shock risk. So any pitfalls? Well, the biggest pitfall is Mr. Bodger. I'm sure it is Mr. Bodger. Mr. Bodger takes a radio that you've got, and when you open it up, he's been in there with a soldering iron, an electric drill, and maybe he's tried to spray the cabinet with some grotty paint. Uh, Mr. Bodger has, uh, could have killed me on more than one occasion, um, but I normally spot what he's done before, uh, before he does that. I'm still here to talk about it. But the Bodger, for a technical hobby, there are some people who shouldn't have ever been allowed those three things I've got on the right. This is the inside of an FT101ZD that I got from my radio club. That is, a, that is an, an AM broadcast pocket transistor radio circuit in there. I mean, the wiring, you look at it. Why did he attack it? It's a perfectly good radio. I, I won't bore you with why unless you want to know at the end. But I've stripped out a whole pile of bits to get the radio back. So the bodger, for me, is a pitfall. I mean, buying a stock radio that just needs rebuilding is a thing. There's another one. That's an F. That's some. Um, that's a Swan that I rebuilt. That's, what, why? I think it's something to do with CW braking. Don't go there. Terrible. So his last slide, uh, pretty much. What do we get out of it, really? That's my uh, KW2000, one of them. What do we get out of them? Well, for me, it's fun. It's fun. Um, and going back to, um, you know, getting something that I remembered so well, I might buy in poor condition. And uh, it's fun for me to have um, brought it back to life. Uh, and it's a challenge. I get a fault. I could spend months trying to find the fault. Um, and it's a challenge and I get a sense of achievement uh, out of doing it and I might have learned something. And that's what I think most people who go for this kit do. And if you build anything or restore anything as small as it is, even the smallest thing, an ATU, a Kia or anything that's old, it's an audio amplifier, whatever it is, it's the achievement of I have brought this thing back to life and it works as well as it did back in the day. That's what I get out of it anyway. It doesn't have to be anything big and complicated like a radio. Um, and let's face it, SSB, AM, CW, FM, RTT, well, they haven't changed for the last 60 years. Um, and a lot of this kit, certainly the, the 70s kit, the performance is quite adequate for rag and on 80 metres. I use it all the time. Um, um, you know, I work people with where their microphone is more than my entire station in here. And I've got about five or six radios in here. The rest are in my workshop. Um, and I take great delight in talking to stations in the US on an old bit of Heathkit gear, which has been given to me, you know, and they've got like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of kit. It's just a bit of fun. For me, ham radio is a bit of fun. Um, and they actually work quite well. I've never found a hidden menu on my uh, uh, KW2000. Um, and it gives me an insight into the so-called history of the people at the time who built them, who designed them. I'm still in contact with the KW people. I understand, you know, the company and what it was thinking and the people who used it and bought it and what were they like. So it gives me a sense of, of history, which is something I like as well. And just moving to the last slide, really, it's a bit like the people who, who, who classic cars. Classic cars is a massive thing in, in the UK. Um, 
a Morris Thousand or any other classic car doesn't drive like your um, doesn't drive like your latest Nissan electric car, whatever it is, does it? No, it doesn't. But you've got to work at driving. You've got to fiddle it and fettle it. And somehow some of us get a buzz out of that. And you get to the shops just the same as your, your super duper modern car. And you get back, we do most of the time. Like my radio might break down. Um, but it's it's that mentality for me, uh, which, it, which, it, which gives me so much enjoyment. So I've had a pretty quick run through to try and uh, keep under the time. I hope you've enjoyed it. I don't know if some of you have built and, and refurbished old kit. And if you haven't, even if it's the simplest thing, have a think about it. Something to do in the lockdown. Uh, if you want to know more about me, that's me, g3zps.com and g3zps ham radio on Facebook. Uh, Vmars is there. And you can find me on YouTube as Telecaster Steve. And that's a mixture of guitars and old ham radios. So I'll hand back, uh, I'll stop sharing and hand back to Nick. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, Steve. That was uh, very, very entertaining. And uh, before I just open it up, various people have commented on the chat while you were talking. Uh, I'll just read out the last one because I think it sums up other people's comments. Thanks, Steve, awesome presentation. Uh, and a number of people um, have, uh, have chipped in with their recollections of the CR100, the RA17, uh, and yeah. some, of the, some of the other kit that you mentioned there. Uh, so I'll, I'll th well, I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to throw it open to uh, the floor. Who wants to go first? Who's, who's the first one to chip in on this discussion? You've all gone very quiet now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a quick one. Yes, yeah, sorry, I've got, I've got, I've got, hang on, who have I got? I've got John uh, G8JMB, uh, and then I've got after him Gerald G3SDY. So, John, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for a splendid talk. I think um, the root of it all, and it's not just radio, is understandable technology. Yeah. Do people fun. play with old cars, steam engines, yeah. old boats, because they can understand it. Yeah. Um, that has disappeared from the present generation of equipment. Um, I sometimes think marketing need to know less is more, with which thoughts I'll uh, join the Luddites. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, John. <laughs> yes. Gerald. <laughs> Hi there, thank you very much for that, uh, Steve. Absolutely wonderful. Looking at all those radios that I always dreamt of getting when I <laughs> when I was young as well. <laughs> and um, it's uh, I got married at 69, 70 ish, so you can appreciate I'd no money for a long time after that. <laughs> I would have loved to add them. But uh, you mentioned quite a few that I have had, which I was quite pleased about. Um, the, the one that you didn't have, you had an 819 set, but the one I couldn't afford one of those, but somebody sold me very cheaply one called a ZC1. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Army one. And that's yeah, very that's, similar. And it's, it is very similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah ZC1. A mobile set in the back of a minivan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some great fun with them. The only one little question, I've got a 101 on the bench down outside in the shed here, and the valves, as you probably guessed, are absolutely totally dead. And... They're very hard to come by the valves from that. Now, do you know if there's anybody still manufacturing the valves for the original 101E? Uh, no, no, the sweep tube, 6JS6s, uh, they haven't been manufactured for about 45 years because they're colour television um, deflection yeah. tubes. And once colour TVs went digital in about, what, 1975, 78, or oh, sorry, went transistor, fully transistor, uh, the market quickly fell away all those old tvs died away and um, what were dead cheap valves because now there have been some on ebay uh, i've spotted some recently on ebay there's some on there now uh, but a pair of them went for 107 pounds uh, uh gerald uh 6sj6 is a sweep tubes a pair of box pair um yeah it, there's, there's nothing i could say other than you have to use your network it, for me, getting the parts is all about networking with your mates mm. and your club friends and maybe going to rallies and that. But sad to say the sweep tubes are a problem now because the, you know, the Japanese have remanufactured 6146s, but they haven't, there's no remanufacturing of sweep tubes and never, there never will be. Mm. There's just no market for them. Um, yeah, so, someone suggested that... Uh, 
Is it working? Yes, I'm working on it. Yeah, uh, it's uh, someone suggested that I took the, all the valve base out and rewired it for a 6146 as a small. Yes, yeah. And, that... and I just wondered if you'd uh, got a secret supply. Well, mm -hmm. I did meet a, a firm called Brymar down at the uh, Leamington Spa uh, rally um, for, for old radios, and they, they seem to be back, started remanufacturing some valves. This is almost like a hobby. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm... Well, two things there really. Um, you can put 6146s in and, and, and there is information on the web about doing that. You can do it um, and the radio will come back. You'll get a radio that didn't work. You'll get a working radio. The matching arrangements will mean they probably will, it will drop off on the mm. upper HF bands. But if you're happy with 80 watts on 80 and 40, top band 80 and 40, then you can put 6146s in and people have been doing that for quite a few years now. That's the first thing. And I've got a KW Atlanta, which came from Tom Withers, TW Electronics. He's dead now, unfortunately. Uh, and that had six LQ, six sweet tubes in it. And he put, or the person who had it before him, put in 6146s. I'll be up in a minute. And um, um, uh, so you can do it, Gerald. You, there is plenty of information on the web. The other thing about Brymar, I don't know if they're actually remanufacturing. I've, I've spoken to them at a couple of places. Um, they, they, they talk it big about getting all the manufacturing gear in, but I think a lot of the stuff they're selling is reprinted badge Chinese valves, which has been that they've tested. So they say it's tested in the UK and it's got Brymar written on it. But um, they're never going to remanufacture sweet tubes, Gerald. That's that's just never going to happen, mate. No, they were just little ones, I think. And I think they were <laughs> yeah, just you... doing them as a, as a hobby to see if they could get the equipment working for fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, well, that was it. Uh, anyway, but somebody else may have some questions. Yeah, okay, I'd better yeah, pass yeah. it back to Nick now. <laughs> thank yeah, you, Steve. Cheers, Gerald. Cheers. Okay, man. thank you, Gerald. I've got John, G4TKO. Hi, John. Yeah, hi. I'm sorry I've been uh, absent, but only listening. <clears throat> the guy that's funded the Brymar is a very good friend of mine who paid and set up the outfit uh, in the Midlands to import all the gear from Yugoslavia and make it work. And they're actually manufacturing tubes. Oh, they are doing about. it, are they? Um, and there's a guy called John Clapham, yeah. and uh, he's the, the guy who's funded the job, and uh, they're actually manufacturing tubes. So what yeah. you see on their website, or to buy, are actually manufactured <laughs> there. Yeah, I think the majority, I think the customer base is going to be the audio uh, uh, people, well, really. They, they have to, it's not, it's not, he hasn't funded it to make money. He's a multimillionaire anyway. I worked with him for many, many years. Right. Uh, I've known him since I was kind of 18, and I'm now 76, 77. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, you'll see him as a big, ugly guy if you look on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Scruffy bugger. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, um, it, yeah. So they're actually making tubes and he, he paid and set up this, uh, it's a bit of a charity, I guess, uh, but it, they're actually manufacturing tubes. Right. Okay. Well, it, sadly, he won't be manufacturing sweet tubes because there's not... I know another them. guy I talk to regularly, a guy that used to sell those called Colin Wilson. Can you remember Wilson Valves? Yeah. Yeah. I had a couple of his... Um, 572Bs in one of my linears. Uh, I think I've got them here. In the, um, <laughs> it's called yeah. now the Voice of America. Lives in Florida and can't stop talking. All oh, right, I've um, I think uh, I think I've had some of his. He imported. <laughs> I think he imported Chinese valves and had them rebadged. I don't know, Rick. I mean, it's a long time ago. It's been yeah, in the yeah. State, I, I, I do know that, that. Um... Yeah, anyway. sadly. The, they're all getting difficult to get. 572Bs are made in China, but a lot of the, the, there are some valves which are now hard to get, and they're only going to get harder. Anyway, the, you forgot to mention one of the the main Yesu uh, uh, rigs, which is 102, which have a well, complete lineup. It, well, yeah, it was, but it was a stopgap, really. I mean, I just couldn't put every rig in. I mean, if I put every rig in, the 102 was some. Um, uh, they brought out the FT1, which yeah. did not have a uh, no, but not a patch on it. And uh, they went back to the the, the 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 102 and the front end begat from the 102 begat the FT1000s front end. Um, 
it's again not the easiest radio to repair filled with them omron relays which um can yeah. uh, can give problems but yeah i can't put every radio in but it's another good uh, it's another good bit of kit for a for a hybrid very good bit of kit however thank you very much for a wonderful presentation cheers uh, john cheers Brilliant. thank you john uh john gw3 jvb Okay, good evening, everyone. Ah, um, John. Yeah, there you go. You may recall, so you might have yeah, an, idea, do, about, yeah. you may have an you idea about what I'm, what I'm going to mention. Fabulous presentation, by the way. Absolutely first class from Drake to Collins to, to the, the KW. Uh, uh, fascinating stuff. I must say, though, the funniest comment you've mentioned on your presentation, and I'm sure everyone will agree with me here, is that it's just a bit of fun. And now, if that's a bit of fun, I mean, come on, you've got some fantastic equipment there that was really, really fantastic to look at and to see it, how, how it progressed through the through the ages. So if that's just a bit of fun, I, I want a bit of that fun. But there's <laughs> just one thing, and you'll forgive me here, I, I, I do this very politely, but I wouldn't want you to make the same mistake a second time at the start. And I know people might be thinking, oh my goodness, what's John going to say now? But at the start of your presentation, you mentioned quite proudly that you were an original G3 license holder. Yeah, I am. And you mentioned you had a conversation with somebody the other day who, uh, who, who sort of flippantly didn't know the name of the person whose call sign they were reusing and that you didn't agree with it, etc. Well, that's fine. You, you're, you're entitled not to agree. But the person who's using that call sign just didn't have the information to hand at the time. Oh, no Mr. worries, John. We're Mr. Already Brown of the you, US in Mugglesworth. The last entry I found was in 1958 in a call, call book in 1958. And just in case yeah. anybody's wondering, GW3JVB is me. G, uh, G3JVB was Mr. Mugglesworth. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Brown. No, I looked, I looked him up. Yeah. And yeah, he, okay, John. I don't know when he became Silent Key, but I, I got the license legally. Um, so no, I think I, I might be the youngest. G3 call sign here, not to, yeah, not the yeah. most experienced by a long stretch, which I think we talked about on air as well. Yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't want you to make that same mistake again. Yeah. No, no okay, John. Um, uh, we I might not agree with it, but I will take your point, mate. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you. Prevailed. Thank you. Thank you, John. And um, Roger's just put into the chat a link to the Brymar UK um, page as it is now with the valves on it which is really helpful, Roger. Uh, right, anyone else got a, a point or question? Yes, Terry, Terry. V, VFC. Yes, how do you do? And uh, absolutely brilliant talk, Steve. Got the gift of the gab to go with the with the uh, equipment, <laughs> lovely. I have been to the Cray Valley uh, Club at the KW Day. And, uh, oh, Terry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it just brings it back to me. Um, I, I suppose I ought really to wave my shortwave magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Just to prove I'm real and alive. Um, the old kit and the new kit, uh, somebody shared with me a few days ago two sound files, um, one of which was taken on top band and uh, uh, during a contest. This is dead recent. This is only you know, a month old. And uh, the other was taken on 20 metres. Uh, uh, conditions were not particularly great, but the band occupancy was not particularly great either. Um, ever so interestingly, the top band just sounded beautiful, uh, smooth, uh, lots of stations, all easily identifiable, one from another, no noise, just signals, uh, just like I remember the old KW kit uh, 2000 when I came up to Cray Valley. Uh, the other one was full of mush, and uh, that, that was 20 metres, and uh, the signals were loud enough. But the signal to noise was appalling. Um, and he said, what's the difference? And I said, well, one's easy to listen to and I could listen to it all day. The other one I'd probably get up after half an hour and go and make a cup of tea. Uh, the 20 meter one, the noisy one, uh, was uh, an ICOM uh, 78, which I think is uh, a, commercial, a, a commercial equipment equivalent of the 70 something or other. Uh, the beautiful one, the one I could listen to all day, was an All World 2, uh, 1930s, would it be? That's an edit zone, All World 2, isn't it, Jerry? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, for, for two valves, 
it just knocked the pants off of the icon. Yeah, well, it, I, was, it, I was staggered. Yeah, probably um, if anybody came up anywhere near on the band, the All World Tour would fall over and fail. It was a, but it was a, a, a top band full of stations. Yeah, full, yeah. And they were all different. I mean, they, it was not Intermod or anything. CW, it has to be said. Yeah, no, I can I can believe it. Um, I built a Paraset copy here, uh, Terry, which I've used. But, um, yeah, when did you come up? You must have met me at the KW day. Then. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, you did, Terry. I remember you. Yeah, <laughs> we couldn't do it this year. I know, so. and very very sad. Very, it was very, very sad. All count the elbow for next year or the year after. Whenever. Well, yeah, it'd be the first weekend uh, GB8 KW, yeah. and um, and it, it's a, it's a shame that we couldn't do this year. I worry about some of the older employees of the company, but nothing we can do. No. Lovely. Thank you, Terry. Um, right. Anyone else with a question or comment they want to put to Steve? I'm just going to look between the two. What's I think you're done here. No, no one's, uh, no one, no, no one's fine. Biting. Yeah, no, no one's biting, Steve. I mean, just a couple of things. Um, you, you talked about the uh, KW two thousand, the prices of them. Um, I, I've got my um, shortwave magazine from nineteen sixty six, May nineteen sixty six. Um, it's a, a favourite of mine because it's my first um, uh, piece of writing. I, I was in the KW in the shortwave magazine in May nineteen sixty six, but the front page has got the KW2000 on it, and it was £173 in 1966. Yep. The, uh, the average wage at the time was £18 a week. Yeah. So it was 10 weeks wages to yeah. buy the KW2000. I mean, obviously, you know, the, like nowadays, the bulk of your wages went in your, your rent and your living yeah, yeah. And, and so on. Uh, so it was, uh, I'm with Gerald, um, as, as a young person in the 1960s and 70s, it was inconceivable for me to be able to no, buy any of that too. kit at all. And that's why we all bought the old CR100s yeah, yeah. and the AR88s. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, they gave us a lot of pleasure. Um, and why, of course, uh, we, we built our own radios as well. Um, I, but um, it, you know, fa fa absolutely uh, fascinating uh, uh, talk through the the various bits of radio there, Steve. And um, everyone, uh, there must be about twelve people that have commented on the on the chat while you were talking there, all of which um, sharing the views that people have put forward tonight when they've put points to you, Steve. You know, brilliant presentation, very entertaining. Um, I, I'm quite sure the newer people in the room that um, are relatively new to the hobby have got as much out of it as those of us that have played in the hobby for 40 or 50 years um, and with, yeah, these guys are nodding so we've got people in the club here who are very new to amateur radio and it's a bit like you know when when as you I mean you gave a good example Steve I'll hand it back to you to have your final word but um you know, it's a bit like buying a brand new car, isn't it? You know, you, someone's got the, the all singing latest BMW. My, my son-in-law uh, buys and restores old BMWs, absolutely loves them to bits. <laughs> he absolutely, he hates the new ones, absolutely hates them. Although if you gave him one, he wouldn't say no, I'm quite sure. <laughs> but he loves restoring these old cars and finding the original bits for them. And I, I, I think you can do that at any age. You can have an interest in, in these things, whether you are 30 years of age and new to the hobby or whether you're 80 years of age and been in the hobby a long time. So, Steve, thank you for your presentation. I'm going to hand it back. Well, actually, before I hand it back to you, can we, can we first of all show our appreciation to Steve for uh, his talk tonight? It was absolutely brilliant. So, brilliant clap, by the way, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Really yeah. good. Um, first class, well done. Thank you. You've um, you've got a brilliant club, uh, Nick, and all the people on here, and a few people from uh, one person from the US, I think, as well. But you have got a brilliant club. There's so many great clubs um, around, and all through this lockdown, I mean, the, the you know, I've given this talk and my other one to clubs that I would never have ever been able to get anywhere near. Um, and this is another yeah, one, exactly. you know, would I've ever driven up to uh, yeah. to you? Probably absolutely no chance. So. Um, 
it, it's been absolutely fantastic from from that point of view and, and thanks very much um and yeah it is a bit like all the old cars and stuff and um you know but i just i, I just like people to get a soldering iron soldering iron out and build something or modify something it, it, qrp radio anything at all it's 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 part of the fun of the hobby but brilliant club thank you very much i'm going to go and get a glass of wine and um, I'm on 80 metres quite a lot. I spoke to John, uh, JVB, on 80 uh, two or three days ago. Uh, I'm on 80 uh, most evenings. I have an old vintage radio there every weekday morning at 11 o'clock on 3 treble 7 on 80. And we've since the lockdown started, I think I'm, I'm over 200 of those now. And I'm normally with a couple of uh, people from down the Cray Valley Club Um uh, who've got uh, Drake and KW gear, and we, and we just come on and only for twenty minutes, just just have a, have a chat. So um, you're welcome anytime. I'm on eighty quite a lot anyway. So uh, cheers, everybody. Thank you very much, Nick. And um, one more question. Uh, yeah. One more question. What was the radio that we that you were using, Steve, when we talked? Oh, because I think it was an FT7, John. Was it? Because just oh. to let everybody know, for for me, I've only been in the hobby five or six years, but for me. The, the quality i think i mentioned to you on you on did yeah chat, steve yeah the, the quality of the uh, um, okay it, I, I think steve might have been using a couple of hundred watts but it was almost really? fully quietening the radio uh, there was no interference it was one of the most pure sounding qso's I've, I've had admittedly nowhere near as much as you guys as many as you guys but what a what an absolutely astonishing. Yeah, you you come and you come to it was an it was a fox dango 7b which was one of the ac's first transistor radios uh, all little plug-in boards i think it's like a bit of jewelry really it's, it's, it's built very very heavy way I've, I've if i can show um move the camera here and um sorry move the camera here and and, and uh and show it what we've got here on the um yeah that's it there ah right okay that's a little transistor radio with them um, lights up lovely yeah wow the 10 10 watts version <laughs> this is the 50 watt version. Okay. Yeah. So um, I plug it into my uh, one of my uh, linears, and that's what I was doing when I spoke to uh, John on it. <clears throat> but it's a, it's it's basically like an FT 101 ZD, but with 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 a transistor PA. It's simplified, and all the all the gadgets, all the the a lot of the noise blanker and the width and all that stuff's all taken out. So they made it for mobile. It's actually pretty heavy, but it's all little plug-in boards inside. And um, there's no processing or anything. I've just plugged the microphone into it and plugged it into my linear, and it sounds great. Well, that's what you said to me. It's just yeah, a it's amazing. A radio, just, John, an antenna. I know. I always use people buy their, um, that make me laugh. People buy these, uh, you probably got them. I'm not laughing at you, um, but people make me laugh and they buy their incredible PR or something or other whole headsets. And I just use, triple fours like this one i think i've got one of them here i've had since 1972 when i was 18 and my parents bought me bought it for so um i just use these all the time and people go oh it sounds good what microphone is it they're, they're, again the difficulty now with, with with some of this kit is the real the real difficulty now since i put this presentation together in the last year is that in the lock in the lockdown and i don't know why this is maybe you, you guys talk about it afterwards or whatever but people have gone mad at buying vintage things. I don't know what it is. You know, you've got to do something at home. The radios have all shot up on eBay. Um, microphones, bits, everything's shot up. I think vintage cars have shot up. House prices have shot up. All sorts of things. If you think, oh, yeah, well, the price is going up. And, um, the, 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 disposable the, income, I guess. Yeah, they've got disposable income. And I, I've bought a few toys as well, but it, yeah. it's... It, it, that's why I want the rallies back. Really, you want to go and, and look at somebody, look at somebody in the eye and say, "I'll give you 150 quid for that, or whatever." So, it, it, since I started, I didn't appreciate how much um, some of this stuff. The Drake gear has just, just, um, just seems to be shooting up. Um, but that's that's the way of the world, I guess. Anyway, it's a great club, and thanks so much for listening. Thanks for your kind comments. I move on to. Uh, next monday to milton keynes uh, milton keynes club next monday and um, if you look at my qrz page you'll see i've got 17 i think now this year so um, um it's, it's been good anyway well, cheers steve, thanks very steve, much steve steve well done a brilliant talk and uh really pleased to have you and you you did say you've 
got another presentation um, on uh, communications in the um, in the police and fire service and so on. Uh, we, we'd love to hear that as well. So we'll yep. I'll be in contact with you and we'll sort of a, a date for later in the year. Yeah, that's an older one. I've been doing that one for a while, so that's pretty refined, yeah. that one. See you soon, guys. Brilliant. Thank you, Sorry, Rachel. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>